Good morning. We come in our daily Bible reading to Acts chapter 7. And what we find in the 7th chapter of the book of Acts in verse 1 is that Stephen is on trial. It says in verse 1, And the high priest said, Are these things so? Now what, we've, what we're going to find in this chapter is a terribly sad story and yet a powerfully inspiring lesson in how Stephen, with his last days and last moments on earth, was teaching about Jesus and the need to not be someone who rejects him, but rather understand that he was the fulfillment of God's plan. If you go back to chapter 6, you'd remember in the reading that Stephen was dealing with the Jews. In fact, some decided that they were going to rise up and dispute against him. But if you remember the text, they had a powerful verse in, in verse 10 of chapter 6. They could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. You see, Stephen had the right idea. He was a man full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, a previous verse said in that chapter. And as you look at Stephen, he is showing the consummate example of what a follower of Christ should be. In fact, he's so much like Christ that even in this trial, as it is, in his death, there are so many shades of Jesus in it. So I want to focus on how Stephen is similar to Jesus and then look at his actual lesson for us and notice some similarities and threads of thought. So one of them is the fact that he's on trial at all for basically doing the right things. For remember Jesus, our Lord, he was crucified, not because he was guilty, and, but because in fact he was the opposite. He was blameless and that infuriated his opponents. He was gaining a following and that made them jealous. And so to, to try to convict Jesus of something, they had to invent ideas. They tried to bring up false witnesses, but that wouldn't really work until they settled on something that Matthew 26, 61 records. They said, well, we remember Jesus saying, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. Now, of course, he wasn't talking about their temple. He was talking about his body, that he would be resurrected. The ultimate sign that Jesus was who he claimed to be and that God's plan was working and in effect. So it's not a surprise then that with Stephen, they're going to try to lob some accusations against him. And notice which one they, they fall on in chapter 6. In verse 14, For we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses has delivered to us. That is the question that the priest looks to Stephen with and says, Are these things so? Now as you move towards the end of this chapter, as we already mentioned, he is going to end up being stoned. And as he is dying, he asks that God forgive them of that sin. He says, in verse 60, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Stephen was willing to stand up for what's right, even against people who were being wrong, even against people who were coming for him unfairly or wrongly. Can we stop and make an application for a moment about Stephen and Jesus? That when we are doing right, people will still do the wrong things. It doesn't always have to be about spirituality, but in Acts 7, and in the case of Jesus in the gospel accounts, it absolutely was. Jesus was blameless. Stephen was teaching in a way that could not be refuted. And even still, he was mistreated, he was afflicted, and suffered the ultimate cost. And he paid the ultimate price. His life was taken. What does that tell me? Well, that tells me that I have to be willing to do the right thing no matter what the consequences are, number one. But number two, I need to realize people are going to be imperfect. I am imperfect, and that's why I needed Jesus to die in the first place. But more than that, if I'm doing the right thing and persecuted for it, I need to be thankful that I know my God is watching this. This is one of the powerful elements of chapter 7, is if you look at Stephen as they are furious at him, and it says, by the way, in verse 57, they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. And they did that when he looked into the heavens, and he says, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. They can't have that. They, they don't want to listen to one more word. And of course, he has this vision of God. And here's the beauty of the story of Stephen. In addition to the powerful words of God watching out for his people throughout the chapter, we see that Stephen was going to go to a reward. No matter what you're facing, please know that there is something better waiting for us. That God wants you to be with him forever. Not in this life facing persecution, just like Jesus. He didn't stay resurrected in our form forever. Yes, he was resurrected from the dead, and that's a powerful sign, but he was raised to sit at the right hand of God, and we can be with God too. So always remember, this world is not our home. We're just a passing through. But secondly, and by the way, to the idea of what is Stephen's sermon about in all of chapter 7, we need to know two very important things. Number one, God always had a plan that involved Jesus forgiving us of our sins, and number two, that when we do wrong things, 
God is still there helping us. You might say, well, it's great to know this world is not my home, but what do I do while I'm here? <laughs> well, I think we need to know and take some lessons from Stephen's sermon in chapter 7 that God will take care of you. Notice he starts out in answering the, the question of are these things so in verse 2 by saying, brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran and said to him, go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. So you see this, this promise of Abraham. Stephen is going to invoke through the most powerful history lesson possible for the Jews to know that God had this plan in mind. It goes all the way back to Abraham. We remember in Genesis chapter 12, and it's mentioned in Hebrews 11, that God told Abraham to go. And he went out not even knowing where he was going. And he did it how? By faith. And by faith, God was going to keep these three promises. That if Abraham was faithful, and he was, that he would make of him a great nation, give them a promised land for the, that, seed, that seed, those nation. And then through his seed, all families of the earth will be blessed. Well, that's the Old Testament. The Old Testament is that Abraham had descendants, the Jews, and they had a promised land that they were working towards, they were in or being pulled out of and hopefully being able to return to. But the New Testament is about Jesus, that fulfilled promise. So Stephen's going to work down that way. Notice in verse 9, and we start to see another theme here. The theme of the failings of men versus the perfect plan of God. Here's some failings of men in verse 9. And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt, but God was with him and rescued him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. Now there came a famine throughout all Egypt and Canaan and great affliction, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers on their first visit. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob his father and all his kindred, 75 persons in all. So as you see this, what happened was two bad things. There was a famine in the land and great persecution because of it, great affliction, excuse me. And also the patriarchs were, verse 9, jealous. So people are sinful. Joseph is sold into slavery, left in prison, all these terrible things. But who is going to make it all work? God will. How does God take care of that famine? How does God take care of Joseph while he's in this world that's not his home? And being mistreated. Well, God is going to allow Joseph to rise in prominence to where when there is a famine, Joseph's family can come to Egypt and have food. That's how God works. We would have never expected that. We would have never written the story that way, but God does because God knows his plan and he knows his people and he's there for us both in the end and in the interim. You need to see that from both Stephen's story and the Old and New Testament readings. But he keeps going and he continues on with the idea of Moses. And of course, Moses is another example of someone you wouldn't necessarily pick to be the leader of the Hebrews. Because if you notice in verse 20, at this time Moses was born and he was beautiful in God's sight. And he was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And we're going to see more about Moses, of course. So we know Moses' is flaws all that he was involved in and all that he did when he even was approached by God. And Stephen gets to that in verses 30 through 34 in particular. Now when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight. And as he drew near to look, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare to look. Notice what God says in verse 34. As the Israelites are in bondage, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and I have come down to deliver them, and now come, I will send you to Egypt. This is, a, this is our theme, that man has a problem, and God has the solution. Do you see that again? The Israelites are groaning, but God sees them, he hears them, and he has a plan for them. He's going to use Moses, the unexpected one. God works in unexpected ways, at least from our point of view. Now you look at this next section in verse 35. You have Moses, of course, and he leads them out, verse 36, performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. And of course, you see a reference to Jesus in verse 37. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. But notice also in verse 39, our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside and in their hearts, they turned to Egypt saying to Aaron, make for us gods who will go before us. And so what do they do in verse 41? They offer to the calf, the golden calves that they made. And so again, here are the people turning on God who's just trying to care for them. But God has a plan 
they they continue on and God still keeps his promise ultimately all the way back to Abraham and the family does inherit the promised land. So it's not a surprise when we come towards the end of chapter 7 that Stephen would say this in 51. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. And what's the response? Now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. Stephen, as we see, when facing temptation from people in front of his face, looks up. In verse 55, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. I do think this is a bit, little bit of a literal idea, but can I make a metaphorical point for us today And as we go through the rest of our week? When the world has got you down and we're looking at what's around us, look up. Do what Paul says. Set your mind on things above. Follow Stephen's example. Look to the glory of God. Know that God is there and that he cares. Look to his plan and how he so often takes care of a people who not only didn't deserve it, but acted as outright enemies of his. And always remember, Romans 5 makes it clear, we acted as if we're enemies of God, and yet Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of our sins anyway. That was God's plan. God demonstrates his own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Stephen's a powerful example of what it means to be dedicated to Christ no matter the cost, and to know what it means to trust in God when times are tough. Hope you'll join us tomorrow for the daily Bible reading in Acts chapter 8.